Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Shake Sales. I'm your host, Maggie Bloom, the sales evangelist at MailShake. And today we are speaking with Bilal Batraoui, and he's the founder of Death to Fluff. He's a Salesforce top sales influencer and a LinkedIn sales star. Bilal is also amazing when it comes to sales tips for the community. So I'm gonna read off the screen for the people who are looking right here, but I just found this awesome quote on his profile that someone said, I stumbled across your posts and community and this stuff is amazing. I've learned more in 30 seconds than weeks of training. It's candid and realistic and not robotic. So I'm super excited to talk with him a little bit today about death to fluff when it comes to cold calling. So Bilal, thank you so much for being here today. Do you mind taking some time to introduce yourself? Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me, Maggie. It's uh, always an honor to do this sort of stuff. I, I don't know where that quote came from. That that hyped me up a bit too much. Let's temper <laughs> expectations, folks. I, I'm, not, I'm not a miracle worker, but that's awesome. I'm glad somebody found value in it. Um, yeah, my background, I, I've been a part of seven startups and pretty much the first sales hire at all of them. Mm. And so when you're in that kind of situation where you're at some no-name startup competing against some behemoth and I've competed against the big boys like LinkedIn, IBM, uh, yeah. the major, major brands. Uh, you got to be resourceful. You got to be scrappy. You got to be a little bit cheeky. Uh, <laughs> you can't do what the founders did when they closed their first couple customers uh, as a seller. You got to, you can't sell quite like that. So it's hard lessons learned and I'm glad, I'm glad they're valuable for others when I share them. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's a different type of selling mentality. I always tell people it's like, try selling something where people have never even heard your name before, like Mailshake. The other company I worked at was Roadrunner. You've probably been in those situations, like you said, seven times where you're just trying to tell people about what you're doing in general too, or what the company is. Yeah, it's it's tricky. It's very tricky. And there, and there are some proven methods. It's, it's not just like uh, an art or something like that. There's definitely a science to it. There are some proven methods to it. And um, over the years, I've, I've had the good fortune of doing a lot of different sales trainings, but I will say as each of them had their own benefits, there was a lot of gaps. There's a lot of things mm -hmm. that they didn't teach me that I wish they did. And that's really what I try to post about is all those things that if I could go back in time 13 years ago, I would tell myself, here you go, X, Y, Z, one, two, three. Yeah. You're going to have a much better time selling now that you know that. So you did get, like you said, there's there's gaps in the training that you've had and you've gone through different set, like sales training programs. So where did you learn about, you know, what's brought you here today and what you post about on LinkedIn? A, a lot of it actually comes from non-traditional uh, uh, places. So what I mean by that is like, for example, um, cognitive behavioral therapy ha is, is like a, a science that's very well known in the psychology field, which I minored in. I wouldn't have been exposed to it had I not gotten that minor. And that whole entire field of study is how you get somebody to admit they have a problem and then take action on that problem. So th that's literally what cognitive behavioral therapy's whole principle model is. Sounds very relevant for a seller, right? Like yeah. when you're dealing with a buyer or you're dealing with trying to persuade people to take action. Mm -hmm. Zero, zero of the techniques known in CBT are ever taught in sales. <laughs> and there's some very core principles that are just universal, right? This is just mm -hmm. basic um, science about how a brain works, how we form decisions, and then how we act upon those decisions. And I'm sure if you're a seller right now, you're like, spill the beans. That, that does sound really yeah. you know? <laughs> So if there's stuff like that, there's stuff from anthropology about um, the the sort of the, the, the archetypes of storytelling that were never in my sales training. And, yeah. and anthropology has seen Across every culture, across every region, storytelling is a core function of culture. And mm -hmm. there are patterns to how stories are told. So we're not winging it. You know, it's not like stuff you need to make up or you got to sit there <laughs> at, at your desk sitting in front of like a blank screen writing a cold email mm -hmm. or you got to become a poet. You don't. There's, there's proven methods out there. But unfortunately, we're just um, not taught those things in our traditional sales training. Yeah, absolutely. And and you, you know, comparing it to uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, it's like, what if we told a therapist like, hey, create urgency for your client, just like right. we were talking about. Before. Right. Like, that would never work. work. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that's not what we're doing. Here. Yeah. <laughs> that is not going to get me more clients at all. But um, <laughs> awesome. No. And, and that's why I'm excited to talk with you. We talked a little bit about this before we hit record. 
um, and this is something you talk a lot about on LinkedIn, is following the buyer's journey versus maybe like a seller's journey. So at a high level, do you mind just talking about the stages and you know how this has helped your sales career? Yeah. And I'll say this was like, I mean, I was probably four years into my sales career before I even learned what the buyer's journey was. And I was mm -hmm. just like, what? Why didn't anyone say this? So <laughs> yeah. if you're buying like a stick of gum, a piece of software, a house, it doesn't matter. You follow five general stages, which is unaware, mm -hmm. aware, consideration, evaluation, decision. It's kind of the beat you follow. Yeah. And and where you are in that those five stages dictates what you need. So if you're an unaware, somebody needs to kind of get you curious. Mm -hmm. And if you're aware, somebody then needs to get your attention and so on and so forth. You go through each of the stages, you can identify an emotion that you're trying to get from people. And it really helps you understand the difference between a target, a prospect, and a buyer. And a lot of sales leaders and sellers use those sort of words interchangeably and they're not. You know, a, a buyer and a customer are not the same thing because a customer yeah. has already made a decision. A buyer has For sure. Already. And so when you start making these words synonyms that are not, you're going to get yourself all mixed up. And what ends up happening is spending time with people who are not serious about buying, mm. getting your deal stuck in status quo, no decision. Yeah. And essentially, you know, the, the worst thing you could do as a seller is, is waste your time because for every minute you spend on somebody who's not going to buy, that's one less minute you have for somebody who was really going to buy. Mm. And if, of all the things that I could say about elite sellers that I've seen over my career that I've worked with, and I've had a chance to work with some master sellers, some really quality sellers. The one thing I could say all of them have in common is they're ruthless with their time. Mm. They do not dilly dally. They don't play games. They don't like to be flung around. Yeah. They want to only work with people who are dead serious. And then if they are dead serious, they will devote themselves to helping them. Yeah. But you got to pass a certain benchmark before you get their time and attention. And uh, I think a lot of a lot of sellers would benefit from that kind of mentality, and, and that comes from understanding the buyer's journey. Where is this buyer really at before you mm -hmm. go spending hours upon hours of time, work, and energy with them? For sure. And everything that you just talked about makes me feel like you're probably the type of person that disqualifies faster than qualifying, trying to qualify someone or fit someone into a box. Aggressively. I, I, yeah. I want to find all the reasons why I shouldn't work with someone right away. Mm -hmm. and, and that just comes down to asking very difficult questions um, up front and just being very frank with people like, you know, we're not for everyone. This won't work. Yeah. Here are the reasons why. I really think you should consider this. I really understand why you think this needs to happen now. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm trying to understand why you feel that's such a big problem and why it became a priority over other things. I'm sure there's a million other things going on in your life right now. Why aren't they the things you want to talk about? I want to push people on those sort of subjects and, and get very clear answers. And if people are wishy-washy or not feeling very clear or confident back, I'm going to tell them, listen, it's just normally this is this, you know, like anything in life, change requires commitment and work. And I don't think this is the best change for you right now. Yeah. And, and people love that kind of bluntness. I mean, mm -hmm. I see bad advice all the time on LinkedIn about like teaching sellers to walk on eggshells, like classic example. <laughs> I see people posting all the time like, oh, if, if you're talking to somebody and they're not the decision maker and you want to get the decision maker on the next call, say something corny like, who would feel left out if we didn't have her in the next conversation? I'm like, or you could just be really blunt and say, in my experience, this product doesn't get approved without the CFO's approval early on. I just yeah. hadn't seen it happen. Mm. I doubt you're the exception. What's stopping us from getting the CFO involved on the next call? Yeah. What would make you not want to do that? Mm. This is very blunt. They're going to yeah. give you a very blunt answer because you're not walking on eggshells and trying to like, you know, formulate this, you know, fuzzy question that you don't need to be asking. Yeah. A fuzzy question. And and as a seller, I mean, I have less experience than you do, but what I like to do in my process is disqualify people early too. And the funny thing is like, sometimes they beg to to keep talking with me. Like I'll say, hey, this doesn't really seem like this is going to be a fit. Um, 
you know, and they're like, whoa. And then they just like start trying to pitch me on why they would be a fit. And I'm like, this is, <laughs> this is kind of cool. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. It's really empowering. Right. It's really empowering because it's a dyna- it's a shift in the dynamic. Um, yeah. You know, pe- people don't realize that. And again, this is why I'm saying it's a science, not an art. You know, when you, one of the things they teach in psychology is social paradigms. So we're in a social paradigm right now of guest and host. Yep. Right. So you you already know that it would be rude of me if I just picked up my phone and started answering a phone call. Mm-hmm. It would be like, wait, you're the you're the guest. You have to be present in mm-hmm. this conversation. You didn't have to tell me that. I knew that. Mm-hmm. But if this was a webinar and I was an attendee, I could totally pick up my phone and take a phone call and nobody yeah. would care. Right. So we know that there's so, certain social norms in different settings, different environments. And so the, the social paradigm of a buyer seller is one of conflict. One mm-hmm. of competing interests, yeah. one of one of um, agendas, you know, mm-hmm. and so you want to get out of that social paradigm as soon as you can. You don't want to stay in a buyer seller social. It's not a it's not a positive one. Right? Yeah, you want to get to something that's like teacher and student, mm-hmm. or um, peers, mm-hmm. or something like that. And and there are ways to do that. Like I was taught very early on in my sales career, I used to do outside sales. Okay, tell us when you walk into an office. And somebody offered you to get you a drink of water, you always say yes. Even if you just drink a bucket of water, you say yes. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Because the act of them going to get you a drink of water is the act of a host and a guest. And that's a much more positive social paradigm than yeah. yourself. So you're changing the dynamic a bit. Wow. And so what you're describing is when you're in a setting and, and now all of a sudden the buyer's pitching you, <laughs> you know, it, that's a very, that's no longer a buyer seller social paradigm. You've changed mm-hmm. it. Yeah, and we changed it by being adamant and and frank with them that this is not in their interest, and now they're like, "Wait, I really think it is." Mm-hmm. That's good. That's positive. <laughs> so, like I said, there's science behind this stuff, and mm-hmm. I went years not being taught it. I'm like, "How did I sell anything?" I'm like, I yeah. <laughs> how I managed to sell anything? When yeah, I this stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the funny part of it too. It's like I've definitely had some of those moments where I'm like, "How did I do?" It? anything in that role before with having like little to no training <laughs> at those spots but somehow we get by in a certain amount of ways but um cool so let's let's talk a little bit about the cold call and how matching this to this these stages that you talked about so the cold call would fall under the unaware aware stage when you're reaching out to someone so how are sellers kind of making the mistakes in in this stage and I've seen you talk about they're they're trying to be the hero in this stage too. Yeah, the like so the the what what people are doing wrong what what kind of the classic thing to do is and and this is the difference between again elite sellers um versus average sellers that are doing this is people think okay, I want to get somebody on the phone and I need to pitch them mm-hmm. and by pitching them, they might be interested in what I have to offer, and then I'm going to have a conversation about that, which is totally wrong. It yeah. doesn't work that way, and you get hung up on a ton. Mm-hmm. And that's why the number one objection, and, and I, I, I've done this with so many other groups to asking, like, what is the number one objection you face when you cold call? Yeah. I'm not interested. Well, mm-hmm. I'm not interested isn't an objection. It's a, it's a, it's a review. It's a yeah. negative review. Think, think yeah. like your pitch was a movie. A movie script and the audience is saying, I don't want to watch that movie. Mm-hmm. I don't like it. And when you think like that, you're like, hey, well, I better change my my script. I need to change what I'm saying because it's mm-hmm. not inviting them to want to have a conversation. So once you realize, okay, people I'm calling are in unaware or aware. And what I mean by that is maybe unaware of a problem, maybe unaware of my company, definitely unaware of me. So there's, there's multiple levels of unawareness that they have. For sure. And within 30 seconds, I want to take them from unaware and saying hello to actually having a conversation with me. How am I going to accomplish that? Mm-hmm. All right. What, what, how, if I'm going to chunk it, how do I go from hello to meaningful conversation within 30 seconds to a minute with a complete random stranger? Mm-hmm. Well, the, the truth is you're, you're not by talking about yourself. Yeah. There's no way, shape, or form. The, like, <laughs> I, I, I don't know what the right answer is to that question, but I can tell you what the wrong answer is. The wrong answer is, well, I'll talk about me. Yeah. I'll talk about my company, what I do, what we offer, and hope mm-hmm. to God that that sounds interesting to them. <laughs> Terrible plan. 
So now you got to flip it and say, well, the best way to get people talking is to ask them about themselves. Mm. Sure. And um, can I accomplish that in the first 30 to 40 seconds of a cold call? Can I state a problem that I think is really relevant with people who are typically in this role or typically at companies like this? Mm. And then ask them a what or how question, some sort of open-ended question about that. Yeah. See if I can get them to acknowledge that problem, to tell me, yeah, that is that is interesting, or you definitely said something that I can relate to. Okay. That's the mic drop method. So we want to go permission, problem, provoke. Permission, um, problem, provoke. It sounds like this. It sounds like, hey, Maggie, you're not expecting my call. Do you have a moment? I promise to be brief. Okay. Um, yeah, well, um, okay, sure. What's this about? And I'm going to say something like, I speak to a lot of CFOs of small businesses, and I know that your number two cost after payroll is health benefits, which have been rising 9 to 12% year over year in the state of California. I'm wondering, how are you handling your second largest cost rising that much year over year? And the number one reaction I got from CFOs cold calling them like this was like, wait, who is this again? Because they were so surprised that I asked them such a smart, well-formulated question and 30 seconds of getting a cold call. Yeah. And without hesitation, I'd be like, oh, this is Bilan from Trinet. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm calling about your second largest costs and I'm wondering, have you been experiencing 9 to 12% year-over-year increases and how are you handling it? And they would just start talking a bit. Well, we have a broker, and you're right. We have been seeing that kind of stuff, and it's been really frustrating. And all of a sudden, we're in the middle of a conversation. Yeah, you know. And 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 so the the key there is that I stated a problem that I knew was really relevant for them, mm-hmm. and then I asked him a thoughtful question about how they handle it, and the confidence of that, and just the research that went into that, makes them want to talk. For sure. And it's really flipping the switch from most cool calls that you hear. I don't get a ton, but that's like, hey, I'm John calling from X and we help X do Y. And it's like, well, first you already kind of, well, I guess for us, you already know it's a cool call, but I get, I, I'm guessing other business professionals that aren't in sales could gather that's a cold call too. And I think, yeah, it's like that, that idea of starting a conversation, but I think that's where you need to, you know, be really targeted and really think about what that question is that you're going to ask them, right? Because you can, and that comes from doing other cold calls or doing research or getting industry insights. But I think that's like the key because if you, I don't know, like, have you ever done those types of cold calls where you kind of missed it or? Yeah. 100%. And how do those go? It takes testing. So the, w- the way you know you hit the right mic drop script and, and yeah. the reason we call the reason I call it mic drop is because I'm holding the microphone at the beginning of the call. Mm-hmm. Like spotlight's on me. And I okay. want to get off center stage and give you the microphone mm-hmm. and then you have your moment. So it's almost like an interview. Remember we talked about the social paradigm? Yeah. The social paradigm of the mic drop script is to try to create uh, a paradigm of an interview versus a cold call. Mm-hmm. Cold call is one of bad, right? It's a bad yeah. social paradigm. It's pitching. It's unsolicited, right? Solicitation is bad. That's a bad yeah. one. <laughs> I want to change it to like, oh, I'm actually just interviewing you. Mm. So I'm asking you a question. So I'm framing a problem then ask you a question and going, here you go. Give me the answer. Yeah. And I'm turning the mic towards you. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to get off center stage and give you the spotlight and let you talk. Mm-hmm. So that's the goal of it. And you're right. There's, there's, It takes testing and you can get it completely wrong. And the way you know you're getting it right is talk time goes up. Okay. So- uh, we want that kind of response from the buyer where they're either going, wait, who is this again? Because they're so surprised and pleasantly surprised by by the quality of the question, or they just start answering it. And the way you know you got it wrong is, again, you you get those, I'm not interested. interested. So we had we did it wrong at BioIQ in the beginning. We we Typically, when I do this, we'll come up with maybe three or four problem statements, mm-hmm. okay? And we'll test each one. And so when we get the wrong one, we still get the, I'm not interested. So okay. we, we found out we were calling at the time um, food safety people through yeah. BioIQ and we were getting hung up on a lot. And mm-hmm. so um, we reached out to um, a food safety person that we knew. We asked him, could we just interview you just to get some like persona research? 
Love it. Like totally. So it wasn't a sales conversation. Yeah. And we told him this is our script. And he told us, oh, no wonder you're getting hung up on. They're like, <laughs> why? And they're like, these food and safety people probably think you're a journalist from a local news. Oh, I'm whoa. Calling them. Yeah. And they would never answer that question because if they did, that might like cause issues. We're like, oh, oh my shoot. God, we went too far. Yeah. Too yeah. Long to their interview. Yeah. Oh, all right. <laughs> Getting too like, deep. They must think we're journalists. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, they would never comment on their food safety procedures mm. to a total stranger. Okay. That can open them up to liability. Yeah. You guys got to tone it down. Yeah. We'll be okay. <laughs> so sometimes you do get it wildly wrong, mm. but it's it's easy to fix. That's just A-B testing. Yeah. Right. And once you do the A-B testing, we toned it down mm -hmm. and immediately we started having meaningful conversations. Our connect our connect rate doesn't change, but our ability when we do get a connection to have a meaningful interaction goes through the roof. Uh, so that yeah. that's sort of the, that's sort of the process you want to follow. And there are other sometimes like for example, I, I give your listeners some some different ideas to think about. Sometimes you don't state a problem, you just state the competition. Uh, we had a product that uh, I sold and it was very rare that we spoke to somebody that didn't use a competitor. Gotcha. So instead of stating a problem, we just went right in with that. We, we would say, look, a lot of wealth advisors use tools like Hidden Levers, Riskalyze, or Totem to do their risk analysis. Mm -hmm. What are you using today? Or are you familiar with those tools? Yeah. We lift our top three competitors right in the first 10 seconds of the cold call. And people be like, yeah, yeah, I've heard of Risk Alize, or yeah, we 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 just got off Totem. We hate it. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're having a conversation. About that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where it comes in of like the the companies we've probably both worked for of like being early stage startups and, you know, people not knowing your name, but using the competitor's name, like the big Goliath in, in the space. Because, yeah, we're in a similar position with Mailshake, like we compete with Sales Austin Outreach. Who hasn't tested out one of those tools or who doesn't know what those are? Um, but it's funny because about three years ago or maybe a little bit before, some people weren't aware of the two big competitors out there. So we did have to, that wasn't really our pitch back then or our, our like go in question, I shouldn't say pitch, but that wasn't really our go in question when we were prospecting. Um, but now it totally is because most people are aware of it. So I love that because yeah, you're, it's like taking those two angles and it's like, one is unaware and then the aware part of it too of testing out and mentioning the competitor's name as well so i think that's pretty cool and and one part of it like your um your mic drop cold call pitch is is the permission based opener and i kind of see this as like a heated debate nowadays but i guess like what's your argument for using one um just because i've heard people that don't use them i mean so i was taught that I know you're not expecting a call. Do you have a moment? I promise to be brief in like 2010. Okay. And I was taught, I was taught it by MJ Hoffman, who used to run a program called Your Sales MBA. Mm -hmm. So he was using that literally like a decade ago and, and even well before that. So like permission based open, it's funny. People think it's like something new. It's yeah. Fun. That's, <laughs> this is like, this has been around for a very long time before some of us were even born. People have been cold calling and <laughs> yeah. that kind of stuff and it works. And it works. Mm -hmm. And if if you find one that you like, go for it. I've always enjoyed that one because I'm not trying to be funny. I'm not trying to be. Uh, I'm not trying to belittle myself and say I'm sorry. I'm cold calling you or anything like that. I'm not inviting them to hang up. I don't like saying that because I'm like, who are you to hang up on me? All right, <laughs> I have rights too. Just yeah, I called you doesn't mean you can you can hang up on me. So yeah, I, I like that one because I think it's respectful. It's tempered and it's direct. And I prefer just to be very direct if I'm cold calling somebody. For sure. You know, the chance to be like, you know what? I didn't, you're right. I'm not expecting this call and I don't want it. I'm like, okay, no problem. We'll move on with our lives. Cool. So that's the one I prefer. Yeah. I think there's some permission-based openers that I've seen that I, I frown upon because I'm like, you know, that's not, I, I think that's diluting the point of the, of what that is. Yeah. And for those that don't use it, and they're totally fine. Well, who's to stop you then? I mean, look, at the end of the day, do you? You know, so if, if you if you don't like it and you just want to go straight into um, you know, like some sort of a mic drop script without any permission, go for it. I just think that if you ever have gotten a cold call, the first thing you're trying to figure out is it's typically an unknown number. 
Yeah. The first thing you're trying to figure out is what is this? Is this like, is this like a family member in an emergency? Is this um, something related to work that I need to know? You're just trying to sort yourself out in the first few seconds of a call, like what is this, mm -hmm. and categorize it. So I want to make that really easy for people, and that's what my permission based opener does. It just tells them, look, it's not an expected call. I am about to pitch you. <laughs> Are you going to give me a minute? Mm -hmm. Cool. If you're not, totally fine. Awesome. Yeah, Bilal, thanks so much for going through you know that permission based opener. And I think you're right. It's it's not something new. Like you said, it's been something that's been around for a while anyway. So it's like, yeah, I, I think it's just a normal way to start a call in general. So just to finish things up, um, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, the buyer stage. We talked about how when you're actually making cold calls, it's going to be the unaware aware stage. Um, and I guess just to kind of end it here, like, what are like one or two things that you find you see sales reps do that are pretty fluffy when it comes to cold calling? Yeah, there's a few. I mean, again, <laughs> the 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 pitching in the first 30 seconds doesn't make a ton of sense. I mean, if you're mm -hmm. getting a lot of I'm not interested, it's because you're not interesting. So just change it up. Yeah. You got to find something that's going to pique their interest. And in. what are you really trying to accomplish in the first 30 seconds of the cold call is just to get some curiosity from them, get get them talking. And, and that's, you know, you got to ask them a thoughtful question if you want to mm -hmm. get people talking. That's about them, not about you. So yeah. don't do that. And the second thing is, um, it's really tempting to use the word help. I think if I could ban one word from the <laughs> most did mouths, it'd be the word help. Yeah. People don't want help. Nobody's asking for un, you know, unsolicited, uninvited help. Mm. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't feel nice when you ask, when people are uh, asking, you know, offering you help when you don't need it, you'd be like, for sure. Hey, help me what? Like calm down, you know, back off. I'm fine. Um, change that mentality because when you say we help or I help blank with blank, what you're saying is I'm the hero and I can save you. Yeah. And you want your buyer to be the hero, not you. The hero of the story, the knight in shining armor is the buyer. Mm -hmm. And you, my dear sellers are Merlin and you are a secondary character <laughs> and it hurts. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense because we're normally the stars of our own lives. But in this case, you are the secondary character and you are there to give the knight in shining armor, the magic sword to slay the dragon. <laughs> You're not slaying the dragon. <laughs> so you got to let them play that role. So when you remove the word help and you start talking about their problems and their issues and getting mm -hmm. them to acknowledge that they have those problems and issues, embracing those problems and issues, then you can tell them, well, we have found that others like you. I've been able to tackle those problems and issues by trying things like blank. And those mm -hmm. things that they try happen to be what your product or offering is. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now yeah. all of a sudden you're not saying how you help people, but you're telling them they accomplished, they, they were victorious and we happen to have the, the sword that they use to slay that dragon. Would you want to try that sword on yourself? Yeah. For sure, because when you think about it in B two B, like what's the goal of the buyer in that scenario? They want to look good to their company. They're in a role where they report to someone most likely, where they want to make a good impression. So if they bring in this tool, if we're talking about SaaS, then they want to make sure that this is something that's going to help like multiple people in their organization solve a problem or save them money in that scenario. So I love it. Be interesting. Remove the word help. Totally agree with you. <laughs> remove the word help. It's hard. <laughs> It's hard, but just cut that word out. Find another way to say that sentence without the word help. And yeah. you'll find you're making a better quality conversation by not talking about how you help. Yeah. It's also just so overused that I kind of tune out once I hear it, yeah. which is kind of mean, but I definitely do. Um, awesome. Bilal, thank you so, so much for being on here today and talking about removing fluff just from the sales process and also from cold calling in general. To finish up, where can people find you or learn more about you? Yeah, so I'm posting daily on LinkedIn just from the journey and experience so you could find it there. And I just started my newsletter. So if you want to sign up to that, it's on a website called nos.io, which is nas.io mm -hmm. death to fluff. So mm -hmm. you can find it there and sign up and get the tips uh, directly in your inbox or uh, on your phone. Amazing, amazing. 
yeah, I'm super excited to take a look at what it's going to look like on my phone. Bilal, thank you so, so much again for being here. Thank you. Awesome. All right, we'll catch everyone next time on Shake Sales. Bye.